G'day, Super Coach community. I am Lek Dog, fresh out of Twitter jail. This is the Jock Reynolds podcast. Thank you to Telebeats for the music. The buy rounds are crumbling before us. I'm joined by Damo, and we've got a shitload to break down, Damo, because the AFL made last minute changes. Maybe for the benefit of the game, I'm not sure. I can't attest to that, but all I do know is it has cooked us. But Damo, our good friends at Supercoach, have uh, tried to tried to help us out and have implemented some changes to the game of Supercoach. Damo, first of all, how are you? Second of all, take us through those changes. I'm good, I'm good, Lek. Yeah, they moved fairly quickly once the fixture change was confirmed. So West Coast and Richmond now playing in round 13, where they would have had the bye, and now they got the bye in round 14, which means there's only five games in round 14, which is going to be hard to go through, but they're giving us two extra trades. Some people are going to use it to their advantage to try and get 18 during the buy round. Some people are going to just pocket the trades and use them later on. Either is fine. To be honest, it's not going to help my team because I've only got 11 players in round 14, thanks to Dane Zorko's absence. Um, so I'm just pocketing them personally, but obviously people have found ways to use them in ways that they can get 18 players for the round 14 buy round now. Yeah, so Damo, what the, we will have... The ability to use four trades this round and four trades next round. And we've also been given two extra trades. If you're on zero, you now have two. If you're on 30, you now have 32. And we can use those two extra trades at any time throughout the rest of the season. All likelihood people are going to use them during these next two buy rounds. So across the next two games, maximum trades, we can make eight trades Look, the, the the short, the long and the short of it is, Damo, we now have most a situation where a lot of people are going to have, you feel like 18 to 20 players, maybe more this round, because let's assume that a lot of a lot of teams had uh, between two and four players from the, from Richmond and West Coast. They're now playing this round. For people who are like you, who do have 12 players or 13 players or 11 players or 10 players in round 14 who were planning to load up on Richmond and West Coast players next week. Uh, I guess there's two school of thought. One, which I think is going to be the focus of this podcast, how can we trade our way into a position where we have 18 scorers on field? And we're going to go through that very shortly. But let's talk philosophically, Damo, before we get to that. Is there any point trading up to 18? Getting 18 players from just 10 teams and shaping completely changing the shape and structure of our teams. Is it worth doing just for uh, a bit of a rank push in round 14 demo? I mean, you're looking at getting your team to a position using trades, potentially all four of them, potentially all eight of them to get you to have 18 players in a particular round. And who knows if that completely wipes you out, how, how many trades you have remaining in the first place and whether it's, it aligns with your original buy round plans. So personally, I'm just going to close my eyes and let round 14 do its thing. But obviously that's not how some people work. And um, it's going to be interesting to see the different tactics, but I don't think people will be aiming for 18 across the board. I think the optimal number that I'm seeing around is people are aiming for at least 16 players in round 14 which, you know, is probably going to be the magic number for that round. But, yeah, I'm going to completely shit the bed that week and just close my eyes and get ready for round 15. (laughs) There are going to be people who can take advantage of this and will be in a good position just by virtue of luck. And luck has a big big influence on Supercoach and the footy. This might not be the last time that this this season is is thrown a curveball. It might not be the last time that... Something uh, affects Supercoach scoring. So I can't, don't think we can dwell on it too much. I think at the end of the day, we've got to try and get the best, the best team out on the park that we can. And if that means you, don't t- you can stick to your, your plans and the, the premiums you want to target, so be it. I don't think if you field 16 versus 18 in round 14, you're probably going to take hit in the ranks a bit. But I don't think, let's say you've, 
the difference is you're fielding two less, you know, you're not fielding like a, a Murphy and a, I don't know, a Coleman Jones now. You know, I don't think you're missing out on heaps of points, Damo. I think I don't think we should panic too much and focus on getting 18. I think we should focus on getting the best players that are available to us. And we're going to start, and I think the best way to do this, Damo, is probably go go team by team. Take a look at the teams that are coming off the buys, who we can target from those teams, knowing that they're most likely going to play in the next two games. And then we'll talk about some other options on the other side of it. Is there any injury news or suspension news? You touched on one before that we need to focus on before we get to this demo. Well, the biggest one is probably Dane Zorko. Brisbane have chosen not to challenge his suspension, so he will miss, obviously, this week with the Brisbane bye, but also round 14. So that throws another spanner in the works. Um, And then obviously Fremantle had the rest of their team pretty much go down in five seconds yesterday uh, on, on on Sunday. And they're probably the main ones. Um, Andy McGrath is going to go down with uh, that PCL. He's going to miss uh, potentially the rest of the season. They're not a hundred percent sure. It's good news probably for Darcy Parish because I think it means if Dylan, even if Dylan Shield comes back, uh, his scoring isn't influenced that much. And it's good news for someone that people are talking about in uh, Kyle Langford, who's seen quite a bit of mid time as well. So McGrath out for, you know, potentially the season. I think that's maybe the, the biggest headline. Tim Kelly, he uh, is he any closer to to coming back? He's or is he... still about three weeks away. Um, Cam Guthrie is due to return for Geelong. Uh, so is Mitch Duncan. Uh, they'll test Mark O'Connor. They'll test Patrick Dangerfield. So they're not too far away. And there was an, a fifth player that Geelong were bringing back that wasn't super coach relevant, so I forgot their name. And we are recording this, as always, on the Monday. We don't know all the injury news. We did have some players return. This isn't. This is just off the top before we get into the the the, the meat of it. But Lockie Neal returned on the weekend. He will be playing in round, or oh, assuming he's healthy, round fourteen. So there are some players filtering back in that. That we can keep an eye on, but let's let's get stuck into this demo. Let's go straight into the Gold Coast Suns. The first team we're going to look at. They had their buy on the weekend. They have a a reasonable amount of super coach relevance for us. And the person on everybody's lips demo is Took Miller, averaging one hundred and seventeen point nine for the year, and he is priced at six hundred and sixteen thousand dollars. He is also, if also, funnily enough, he's their highest total point scorer, even though he has played less games than uh, than a bunch of their players. Damo, let's start on Took Miller. What are we looking at? Can we justify paying over six hundred grand for a bloke? Oh, look, I mean, he is quite expensive, so you would need to give up quite a bit to get him. But people have James Jordan sticking sticking around. Obviously, some people have got Matt Flynn stuck on their bench. Um, some people have Anthony Scott around. Some people have. People have options that they can move on to get him. It's just whether or not they want to spend 616k on him. Positively enough, he hasn't gone below 115 since round six and has only had two scores below 96 for the whole season. So you're pretty much paying for consistency on that front. But yeah, as you say, do people want to spend that much? And usually the answer is no, but this year there's, a bit of a rift between the best and the worst and the best and the next tier midfielders in Supercoach. So really, do people want to pay that much and can they afford it, I guess, is the main questions. Well, Supercoach Gold has him projected to go up another 40K um, over the next few weeks if he keeps it up. My question, and I don't think this is a massive question because I personally don't think he's going to come into the team and affect him, but people are asking the Matt Rowell question. Does Matt Rowell come back into this team dominate that contested that contested side of the game and stop Took from scoring the way he is. I'm not so worried about that. My concern is more the, the price point. I, I, I'm I not worried about his performance changing too much when Raul comes back. Do you feel any differently? Yeah, I don't think Raul is going to change Took Miller's role any, any more or less. Um, I think... Once he comes in, it's more likely a David Swallow or a Hugh Greenwood that gets moved around. 
let's look at some other super coach relevant players. And Hugh Greenwood, you dropped his name there. I'll drop in Brandon Alice as well. Hugh Greenwood, $513,000, averaging 98 for the year, mid only. Brandon Alice, $488,000, averaging 99.5 for the year, mid only. These guys are both in barely any teams. They are sub 500K, which, which is value. And when we're trying to recover from these buy plans being shifted around, I think that looking for value helps. Really, either one of these a player that you'd consider in, in your side? It would be nice if Hugh Greenwood kept his forward eligibility, but um, obviously he's only a mid for this season. Um, I think I don't think they're going to be uh, good good enough for most people in their situations. If you're a league player, they might be okay, but um, as most people that listen to this podcast are going for overall rank, no, I don't think that they're good options, but they are nice and cheap. Is there anyone else jumping out that we should talk about in this Gold Coast lineup? Uh, Jack Jack Bowes isn't listed as injured anymore, according to Supercoach Gold. So he might be someone that people can jump on in their defense. 466K. I've obviously uh, dropped that 45 in the game that he got injured, but didn't play the full game. Has been fairly consistent before that. Um, he's He's been good. He's been good. I, I hope... So in his absence, Lukosius has gone back there and, and tunned up a couple of times. If you're looking at Lukosius, um, I'd like to see them both in the same team before you made that decision because I feel like Lukosius just slotted back into Bo's position when Bose went down. One thing about Bose, and I think he's a great buy option at $466,300 in defense, his break-even is 140 because of that last game where he's injured. If he comes out and does what he's done all year, which is easy you now, he's averaged 97. If he scores 100, he's going to drop 20 grand. Next week, you'll be able to get him for 440K. I think you probably watch him. And he's also coming back from injury. So let's watch him for one more week if he is named this week. And I think we've got a real bargain on our hands there. Damo, is there anyone else from this Gold Coast team we should be looking at? Oleg Markov has been on some people's minds and just having a quick look at him he is 425k only really averaging 85 but in the last few weeks he has tunned up with only a f- with apart from a 49 he's got 113 101 and 103 so i don't know if his role has changed in the absence of jack bows as well but um i i wouldn't go for it but obviously you got to bank on someone's purple patch and um, hopefully it continues because he's cemented himself more in that Southern side. If Matt Rowell's named next week, is anyone, he's going to get jumped on by a lot of people despite his break even being 200. Is that, or 197 to be clear, is that insanity to you? <laughs> if he's someone that people want to have in their team come the end of the year, I don't think price going up or down should dictate when you trade someone in, especially if you have the funds. Um, but at 495K with 197 break even, he's every chance to get down to 440K. And this year, that extra 50K is probably going to be more valuable. The final name, and I agree with you, the final name I want to throw out there is Ned Moyle, mid-season draft pickup, Ruckman. He's in 24 teams. Currently, at time of recording, is he going to play in a team that doesn't have Ruckman? Well, they've got Zach Smith playing at the moment, so I wouldn't think so. I'll say it again. Is he going to play in a team that doesn't have Ruckman? (laughs) They've tried to get him into Queensland for some training sessions, but obviously with the borders up, it's made it difficult. So I think he might play soon, but I don't think it's going to be straight away. I don't think he's going to save us for the buyers. And I think we've got plenty of playing options that are probably better options uh, to replace our, to downgrade our Flins, et cetera, too. All right. I reckon that's the Gold Coast Suns. I reckon we've uh, taken a look at them pretty well. Some options there. Let's look at the next side on our list, Damo. Which is the next side we are looking at? Uh, Geelong. The Geelong Cats coming off the buy. Plenty of super coach relevant players here. Plenty of primo priced players. Who's jumping off the page at you, Damo? 
Cam Guthrie, but he sits in the same price bracket as Took Miller. He's obviously missed that game with the shoulder injury before the Cats buy, but he's a test for the game against Port Adelaide this week, averaging 119.8. Uh, has a break even of 129, which he's more than capable of actually eclipsing. So this, so you could probably stick, uh, not get him this week because you probably won't change too much in price, but. I think he's a good option. Mitch Duncan should return from his concussion. He's another good option. Joel Selwood has turned back the clock, and he's 514K, uh, currently in 4.8% of teams. Uh, Tom Stewart is ever reliable in defense as usual. He's 522K. Stop me whenever you like, Lek. Tom Hawkins, demo at $513,000. We know he's a guy that just, he does it every year. He's always amongst the top forwards it's because he can go big it makes up for his inconsistencies his ability to go his ability to go big five round average of 106 three round average of 106 uh 513k as i said break even 79 not sure uh the the pending return of patrick dangerfield is going to uh, impact some of these players i feel like tom hawkins is one that uh is not going to be too affected, even if Dangerfield does play in that forward role. I feel like Tom Hawkins is going to be a guy that can score anyway. I really like him as as an option if you're looking to finish your forward line at 513k. That's not too expensive either. And he's a pod, less than 5% of teams. Yeah, and as you said, his high ceiling sort of balances out the bad games that he has. And um... If you're a league player, probably not someone I'm looking to get. If you're going for rank, I think he's someone I'm willing to back in. Would you be look? Would you be looking at a player like uh, Zach Tui, who's been on a Richard Manor form? <laughs> I have him open. I have his tab open. So Zach Tui, four fifty four k nine four fifty four nine hundred dollars. Break even is fifty five. Five round average ninety eight point eight. Now, the only reason I know about him playing well is, as always, I have him in a keeper league. In all, he's in my team of old people who are vying for a flag. And his last four games have been awesome. He's been playing back in defense. He's been taking kick on, kick-ins. He's been amassing. He had 25 kicks and two handballs on the weekend. His role is he's really, really super coach friendly. The only question, Damo, is can he, he keep it up and will Scott keep him in that position or is it going to be a shuffle of the deck once again? You can never trust Chris Scott, but he does love Zach Tui. And now I'm seeing Zach Tui as a mid only. I'm not sure if he's going to be an option that people go for, but that's the downside. (laughs) (laughs) To be honest, when I said his name, I thought it was a, I thought he was defense, but um, at 454k, if you're desperate, he might not be a bad option. And then let's talk about the man himself, Patrick Dangerfield. We don't need to talk about like he's going to affect some of these players. I don't know which ones, and I can't think about it right now. My brain isn't capable of functioning. If he does come back this week, break even is one ninety eight. Price is six hundred eleven thousand nine hundred dollars. He's a forward uh, mid. I doubt anyone's jumping on him this week. But if he scores 120 next week, he's going to go down by 35K. He's going to be 580-odd. Is he someone we're looking at for the round 14 bar? I, to be honest, he scored 92 and a 75 in the two games that he's played. And in both games, I haven't been that impressed. No. Injury interrupted preseason, now injury interrupted season. I think there's a, a lot of risk with running with him when he does come back, and hopefully it's this week so we can see him before that price drop. But I feel like the the name is going to suck a few in. Yeah, and I think he's going to be one that, a bit like a Tom Rockliffe, he's going to be one that people aren't really going to look towards for very much longer as a reliable super coach option. Obviously Tom Rockliffe um, has come back in some way, shape or form to be a reliable starting pick for some, but um, yeah, no, I don't think Patrick Dangerfield is the man we once thought he was. 
<laughs> yes, he has aged, unfortunately, like like all humans tend to do. The GWS Giants, it's time to talk about them. Uh, let's go straight to Matt Flynn. We're trading him, right? I would trade him now, yeah. The reason I think we're trading him, and I know it's a week where we're trying to get as many players on the park as we can, now that uh, we've got a number of options. People would have traded in Coleman Jones. People can trade in or would have traded in Reeves. We've got plenty of playing, touch wood, downgrade options for him. So I think he is a trade this week. Obviously, if you've got other issues, you can hold him. But I think um, at, at what's he priced at now, $367,700 break even of 74. I think he's just about peaked. So I think we can trade him. He's a good source of cash for us. If we're looking at players to get on field and score for us, Damo, from the GWS Giants, who's uh, at the top of your list? Josh Kelly at 562K, averaging 119 over his last five games. Obviously had that lean start playing in the half forward line. Um but since round seven has gone 129, 111, 132, 102, 122, and he comes up against North Melbourne this week, so he could score his annual 200 like he does. <laughs> yes, yes, he could. I know, is it, um, is it Clarky who's annoyed that people are jumping on because he started him and had to sit through all the bullshit? But he has, he has come good. He's been immense over the last five games. Um, and really pushed that season average up with some huge performances. The usual question marks are all there. But this is a guy that's capable of scoring like these other 600K players we've talked about, and he's 50K cheaper. He's 560K. So I understand the appeal. I don't know if I prefer Tim Taranto, but he's a further 40K cheaper, and he's putting up pretty good scores as well. Five round average of 110 Five hundred twenty-six thousand six hundred dollars break even is one hundred and twenty-five, and he's been very good for those that uh, backed him in after a slowish start to the season. Yeah, if we're talking about uh, looking at the season as a whole, you probably would have preferred to have start started Tim Taranto and stayed with him through his annoying games. But um, if you're talking about players to trade in now, I think I'd go for Josh Kelly. Yeah, packs a bit more of a punch for Supercoach. The guy that I'm very, very, very much excited to get into my team demo is Lockie Whitfield at $503,600 in defense. Breakeven is 70. We thought he was going to probably drop a bit more, but he, he came back from um, injury, went 83, 74, 80, and then he went, okay, I'm going to do what I do again, 110 and 120 in back-to-back weeks. He looks like that fitness base is starting to uh, he's starting to get that under him. He's cheap. He's not as cheap as some of the other options we have in defense, but he has dropped fifty eight thousand dollars. I think this guy should be a prime target for people playing at home. Yeah, he's definitely someone I've weighed up this week, but um, no, I've gone for someone else, which we'll talk about later. Oh, I'm very very excited. I think in terms of uh, in terms of the gold, uh, the GWS, sorry, the GWS Giants. I'm not sure that there's anyone else I'd I'd want to be recommending. I don't think I want to recommend a Callan Ward, just not cheap enough for what he's producing. Jacob Hopper, a nice pot if you started him, but just not someone I'd be trading in when Josh Kelly's on the table. Maybe. Like, if Toby Green can get back, is that someone you could trust for the rest of the year? We've still got 12 rounds left or whatever it is. I mean, you look at his next three. He's got North Melbourne, Carlton, and Hawthorne. And then he... He will destroy Carlton and then he come, if he plays. And then he comes up against Melbourne, who could probably keep him quiet. But then he's got Gold Coast, Sydney in that Battle of the Bridge, Essendon, whose defense leaks goals. Put up, I think you missed a Hawthorne in there as well, who are bad. <laughs> I said Hawthorne, but yeah, they're going up against Hawthorne as well. Then they've got uh, Port Adelaide, Geelong, Richmond, and Carlton again. Oh, so, God, he plays us twice. <laughs> oh, no. So he could definitely have an end to the season that where he could average 95. 
he's one uh, actually just looking at the GWS uh fixture I really like this for them I think they're going to be a great source of points for us and he's a guy that that I'm definitely looking at I I'd, I'd love him to be named if he's named this week and plays I will take the pun on him four hundred and sixty three thousand one hundred dollars break even 118. If he's named next week against the Blues, I will 100% take the punt on him because he's going to destroy us. He's going to kick 10 goals. It's that giant stadium as well, which he which he loves playing at. I like him. Is there any cheap uh, rookie options that are coming into contention for this team? One name we didn't mention for, for uh, Geelong was Max Holmes. Just not someone I'm going to trust, particularly with the names they've got coming back. Yeah, I think the Phantom wouldn't be very happy if we didn't mention Tom Green. Okay, let's mention him because he has had a decent little run of form. Hey, he's had a decent run of form, but he's also scored like a mid pricer. Yeah, well, he is a mid pricer, so I don't think we should be surprised. Uh, so, in the last five rounds, what's this? 111, 104, 71, 123, 60. Yeah, all right. Moving on. <laughs> we love that you love him, Phantom but not someone I'm looking to trade for. What's the next team on our list, Damo? Hawthorne. Oh, you can uh, lead the way here with Hawthorne. They've got a, another team with some really decent options, one very sexy defensive pick. Well, you've got Tom Mitchell, who seems to be scoring 70 and then 130. So he's an up and down pick that might be a good option to end the season with, 542k. Hopefully the week off has helped him uh blake hardwick in defense like dog your boy 504k <laughs> not my boy <laughs> very annoyed that all the signs were there pre-season when we were opening up uh, footy cards on the stream and i got eight thousand different versions of blake hardwick and i didn't think oh, i should pick him i just thought who is this prick and why is he in my card collection but anyway i hopefully they're worth something now i've got a lot of them but having a very good year at 97.5 average. Then there's Jarman Impey, which people are talking about trading out, which I wouldn't do. Good God, no, 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 not this year. I, I'll i say it does look like his role is changing a bit, but hold off a couple of weeks for the love of God. Hold off a couple of weeks at least. Um. Then you got... Chad Wingard at 433k, who has scored 92 for the last three weeks. Um, yep, and people are going to buy on him. I imagine we're going to see Baron Von Crow trade him in if he hasn't already. I know Patch is clamoring to get him in as well. Uh, people are trading in Ned Reeves, the Ruckman popular rookie pick for this week. Uh, and people are also trading out uh, CJ Jath, which I kind of understand, but if, if he's... If he's going to play the next two weeks, is it worth holding him? That's my thing. Like, if you're in a position where you've got... It's, people are going to be like, I've got 21 players this week. I can afford to trade out a CJ. But then I, you've got to look ahead to next week. If you're trading out a playing player and you still only got, like, 11 players playing, what are you doing? What are you doing? Are you just punting? I think we've got to be careful with these trades. And sometimes, sometimes the right action is no action. And I'll throw a name at you that you probably didn't expect me to talk about. Ben McAvoy at a 433k. Defender Ruckman. He's had three tons in the last five weeks. So what if you're in a situation, Damo, here's the situation. You've still got Grundy. You wanted to wait and see. You trade Grundy down to Ben McAvoy. You make yourself, what's that, 200 grand? Grundy comes back in a couple of weeks. You go, you know what? I've also got Ned Reeves on my bench or I've got whoever's, you know, C- uh, Coleman Jones on my bench. I'm going to upgrade them back to uh, to Grundy. Flick McAvoy into defense. Bang, bang, bing, bada, boom. Or you upgrade one of your defenders. Lockie Jones. You go, all right, Lockie Jones in a couple of weeks. Trading you out. Swing Ben McAvoy back. Swing Grundy back in from the trades. All of a sudden, Ben McAvoy is your D6 and you're laughing. Yeah, I mean, I was sort of thinking something similar there, but um, gives you something to think about, doesn't it? <laughs> hey, if if we can't provoke thought, what can we do? The downside, obviously, is that he's old and he does score seventies 
uh, regularly. So if you can cop that, if you think he's not going to do that, um, it's it's a, it's an interesting one. It's a tempting one. I love him off a draft waiver wire. How have we not spoken about him? Jack Scrimshaw, $466,000, break even of 82, five round average of 99.4. So in his last five games, 103, 89, 109, 105, 91, lowest score there is an 89. Uh, and the first five weeks, he struggled a bit. His high scores were 81 and 96. But, hey, recent form, he's cheap. He's a defensive option if he's healthy, he's playing the next two weeks. Is there any reason we wouldn't select him? What sort of role is he playing? I haven't been watching the Hawks, but I feel like he's the kind of player that he's had the week off. Clarko will come back after a week off and say, you know what, Jack, I think you want to do this now. I feel like... Yeah, look, I, I honestly, I, I don't I don't watch him enough. I know that when, against the Blues, I feel like he was there. I feel like we kicked it to him 700,000 times, uh, but we do that every week with someone. So he was the player for that game. I think I think he is playing like that that uh, that Jace, James Sisley role, but he, he worries me. He reminds me kind of like a Jack Lukosius where I feel like he's good enough to do pretty much anything. So do we trust Clarko to... to maintain the uh, integrity of our super coach selections. Oh no, I can't trust him at all. We don't trust many people in the super coach world. And he scored a 17 in round two. So I don't know if that was injury affected or not, but you take that out and he's actually averaging 90 for the season. So do we think Jai Newcomb, $102,000 mid season four year contract, Rookie recruit. Now they want to change the rules of the mid-season draft, even though free agency should be allowed for everyone who's nominated for the draft and it shouldn't matter. Is he someone who is going to play for the Hawthorne Football Club? I'd be staggered if he doesn't play pretty soon. I don't know if it's going to be as soon as this week, though. I mean, but there might be, there's still val- potentially value. Let's say you're in a in a dream scenario where all of your players are playing. You don't have any donuts, any permanent donuts. You don't have Harry fucking Sharp in your team or whatever his name is. Is it Harry Sharp from Brisbane? It's Harry Sharp. Jesus Christ. Is it a viable option in just trading him in, making some cash, trading in that 102K player, knowing he's probably going to play later on, even if it doesn't help you over the next two rounds? Yeah, people will be looking at these mid-season draft players and hoping that they can play within the next few weeks. You've got Jai Newcomb at the Hawks, and then you've got the likes of Ashley Johnson at Collingwood and um, maybe even Charlie Ham at North Melbourne. <sighs> I've, been a, I've been a little angsty since I've been in Twitter jail, you know? I'm a little angrier now. I've got to say, I say swears on the podcast. Should we quickly talk about you being in Twitter jail? It wasn't fun. Yeah, what, what was it like? It almost talk, took talk my whole it. will to live. To, not will to live, but my whole will to be interested in football almost ex- disappeared over two days. It's ama- what does that tell you? It's amazing how your interest in football is reliant on Twitter being available to you. Well, I like all my friends who I talk to footy about are on Twitter and I've been in a in a group chat with people for like 10 years and we talk every single day about footy. And then, like, I couldn't engage with all Carlton people about how sad we all are. It was it was horrible. And, I mean, here's a lesson. I, I didn't – I don't think I did anything wrong. I'll just say that. I, I did get permanently banned, though, because I wrote the words, I will kill you, to someone. I was clearly joking. I was clearly trying to be Liam Neeson. Um, I will not be baited into answering people asking if they should take Max Gorn's 144 points anymore. Um Shout out, uh, shout out to Twitter. They they sorted it out. Shout out to Baz, who I was the person I directed the tweet to. He knew it was a joke. He's obviously seen me speak before. He knows I'm not a I want to kill you kind of person. But uh, just a just just a little piece of advice: if you write the words "I will kill you" on Twitter, you will get banned by bots. If you write "I will kill you," lol, doesn't seem to apply. Or if you use a GIF, doesn't apply. Anyway, I'm okay now. I almost didn't come back, Damo, but I'm glad to be back and I'm already in the thick of Supercoach chat. Yeah, moral of the story, if a if your VC scores more than 120, let's say 120, you should probably take it. By the way, I was very happy with Zach Merritt. I had him as my captain. The, the, the theory never fails. If they average 100 at the venue and average 100 against the opponent, it does not fail. 
Move on. North Melbourne, Damo. Thank you for checking in on me, by the way, over the weekend. It was very lovely. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure you, you were still alive. I was alive. It's, I started, um, I was in Discord with my friends and I started posting what I would post on Twitter in there. And people were like, we, you need to either make a new account or get unbanned because we are not putting up with this any. We're not putting up this. You, this is not Twitter. I was like, okay, fair enough. <laughs> North Melbourne, Damo. North Melbourne. Let's talk about him. Well, the obvious one's Jack Zebel. Most people would have him in their team, though. He's already he's in 61%, almost 62%, 103,500 teams. Uh, that's a lot of teams. That's a lot of teams. And then you got the likes of Aaron Hall, who is, well, I still can't come around to, to Aaron Hall. I just, I don't, I don't believe it. I I believe in his ability to score. I believe in his talent. I always have. I've always had a soft spot for Aaron Hall. But I just, I'm looking at him and he's, I mean, he's already missed two games this year. But I just don't believe he's going to play the next 12 games. I don't believe it, Damo. That is my problem. And already limited on trades, I can't bring myself to bring him in. He's scoring very. He's scoring amazingly well. Amazingly well. He he's only had one non-injury affected game where he didn't score a hundred plus. He has been awesome this year. Shout out to everyone who jumped on him. I just can't bring myself to trust him. I'd much rather just go with a Tom Hawkins and ride that key position roller coaster. Ben Cunnington's scoring a lot still. Another one that I uh, that I suggested and didn't listen to my own advice. But he's got a five round average of uh, 120 in that time. He's had an 80. Uh, he's had a 66, which was terrible. But he's had two scores of 142 plus, a 134 and a 113. Like the man is dominating. He's their best inside midfielder, and he's uh, playing very well. He is playing very well, and he's. Started, he came back from his little injury layoff at the beginning of the season and pumped out a 92, 71, and an 86. And everyone thought, here we go. Then North Melbourne's form sort of dictates how well he scores. And then all of a sudden, he got he snapped into gear and he's gone absolutely bananas. He's probably too expensive to look at now, though. $549,800 break in with 73. I'd. I'd much rather go for a Josh Kelly, but then he Ben Cunnington's probably less injury prone than Josh Kelly. It's very confusing, Super Coach, to me this year. I honestly think you're not going to go wrong with either of them. Ben Cunnington's less likely to have a role change, though. Yeah, that's true. He's in less teams as well, so the, the, there's uh, more to, more win loss there, I guess. Like. The min maxing, um, it's the opposite. You're max minning because he's not in many teams. Anyway, it doesn't matter. He is a reasonable selection. Anyone else? Well, do they have any of these these guys? I'll say this: I still have Tom Powell in my team. I'm holding him for the next two weeks, assuming he plays. I know he's going to lose cash, but I just think having a warm body is more important than anything else right now. But do they have anyone? Did, did any of these rookies they picked up? Are they going to play? Is this uh, who did they get? Jacob Edwards is he a chance to play? Charlie Ham? What are we thinking? Jacob Edwards is no chance to play. I would have thought Charlie Ham's more of a chance, but they're two very slight kids. If Ham gets picked this week or next, would 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 you trade him in? Or is he a guy you're only going to move on the bubble? Given that he is uh, defense only, I th- I think I'm pretty stuck down there, so I'm probably going to say no. The hard thing is that normally you get a team on that's struggling and struggling to win games and and whatnot. They'll beat the Blues in a few weeks, but apart from that, they haven't. They, normally, there's like a standout. I guess they've got Zeevil Hall, but I just feel like the the bottom teams normally give us a bit more than this. They've just given us nothing. I guess Luke McDonald's been injured. Jai Simpkin, who was the must-have last year, is he of any relevance? Like, is he a chance of being a top, uh, an upper echelon scorer this year? No, I haven't seen him return to the form that he was in last last year at all. 
I'd bet. No, you had one game, right? Where he scored like 160. Yeah, that was against Hawthorne. Oh. Well, if they play Hawthorne every week, <laughs> I'd be interested. Their end to the year is also quite tough as well. Jeez, things are only going to get tougher for the North Melbourne Football Club. Next on the list, Damo, is Port Adelaide. And is this the final team that we will be looking at from the buyers? This is the final team. Let's talk about them. There's a guy that you love. He's their highest scorer this year. Hit me with him. Ollie Wines. I've chosen him to come into my team this week. So he's in 2.5% of teams. He's 549,800 dollars. Break even is 94. He is averaging 104.5 for the year. He keeps pushing that average up uh, after he had a, a dip, a little dip to, in the first three rounds of the the season. But the last few weeks have been good, Damo. Yeah, and his form has been really, really, really good. And there's even talk that he's in the top five in the Brownlow predictor as well. So if you can keep this sort of form up, then I'm hoping his scoring can continue. I mean, first of all, uh, I was I, we talked about the, the Brownlow before the, the pod and I was like surprised, but the, I thought about it and I don't know who'd be ahead of him, at least in their team. I don't think Bokes had an outstanding year by his, uh, his standards. I think, yeah, it, He's a ball winner. I reckon Carl Amon would have stolen a few votes in those first few weeks. He was on fire at the start of the season. Yeah, Carl Amon came out of the blocks really, really strongly, but has sort of settled down a little bit. It's Ollie Wine's turn to grab the spotlight, and, well, he's doing quite well with it. Yeah, he does. He is a guy that requires getting a lot of the ball to post scores, and he loves to handball. But the good news is... He's very good at doing that, and he's had, uh, I'm just looking through his stats, one, two, three, four, five, six games this year where he's had 21 or more handballs, and he seems to to score well when he's doing that. So I think their system is working to his advantage. They love him being the extractor. They love the ball in his hands. I think, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't continue. What do you see him averaging from here on out? Uh, if we're talking from now to the end of the season, I can see him averaging 112. Jeez. If 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 he can do that at 549K, it, it presents a reasonable amount of value. And he's in this discussion, this mid 500 to 600K price range where you, you get a... I don't think you're going to be unhappy with any of these guys. With your Wines, with your Cunningtons, with your... Kelly's with your Tarantos. I don't think you're going to be unhappy with any of these guys, but this is a kid that's in his four, in his prime, is in in the perfect age bracket for super coach scoring. He's got a great game for it. Plays contested footy. He's not too hurt by disposal efficiency because he goes by hand a lot. Damo, I, I really really like it. Yeah, I, I'd spent a lot of time looking at who to bring in this week, and I've been settled on Ollie Wines for quite a while, so. I'm happy to have him now in my side. Let's talk about some other options that we might consider. Travis Boat, $533,800, break even of $125. is not having the amazing, crazy season I thought he would. He's still averaging 109.4 for the year. Uh, last couple of games have been slower, though, 97 and 96. Not you don't. I don't love that form line. What what's the feeling here on the Travis Boak? He is cheaper than Ollie Wines. There was a time when I thought I would have to go for Travis Boak instead of Ollie Wines because my trade plans hinged on Riley Collier Dawkins and Tom Highmore either staying at their current price or gaining some money, but they both lost money. So I had to alter my plans slightly. Um to bring in Ollie Wines, but I'm happy with the result that I've got Ollie Wines in. I do like Oli, uh, Travis Boak as an option, though. Um, he's fairly consistent, and he won't do you wrong most weeks. The 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 downside of a Travis Boak of the two Ollie Wines and Travis Boak, he, Boak is far more likely to get a rest at some point. I don't think that's going to happen. But towards the end of the season, round 22, they've got the Blues at Marvel. They got the Bulldogs. He'll he'll play that game, and they've got Adelaide in round twenty one. There's a chance that he's rested. It's not a big chance. It's not a high percentage chance, but I'd say it's a chance. Whereas I don't think there's a chance someone like Ollie Wines gets rested. 
Yeah, less less likely that Ollie Wines gets rested. Let's talk some other options from the Port Adelaide Football Club. Charlie Dixon, $462,400. Break even, 55. He's got a five-round average of 98, a three-round average of 109. And Big Ben has been tweeting at us about him for weeks, Damo. Weeks. What do you see in the big, uh, the big dead man, the big walking corpse, Charlie Dixon? Well, he sort of sits in the same pocket as Tom Hawkins, doesn't he? He does. He does. He does. I guess it's the the upside of Charlie Dixon is 50K cheaper than Tom Hawkins. Yeah. The only issue that I have with Charlie Dixon is, well, as you said, he can go missing. He can go dead. Against your boys, he was able to score pretty well, 138 points. What did you see? Like, is, Was it just him taking advantage of a weakened Fremantle defense? Or? Yeah. I mean... He- that first quarter was probably a mistake putting um putting was it who was it Taylor Demand on him who's built like a stick figure but um after quarter time they put Brent Brennan Cox on him and it was a, a more even contest um but yeah it's not too hard for key forwards to beat up on the Dockers defense at the moment <laughs> Damo, one other name I want to throw at you he is a forward Midfielder eligible player four hundred and twenty four thousand one hundred dollars break even of sixteen. Sam Powell Pepper probably not a super sexy name compared to the other players we've talked about in this podcast. Last two games one hundred and seven and one hundred and thirty. Prior to that seventy five fifty five and seventy four. So like not setting the world on fire. Just wanted to chuck him in there as an option. You know we're trying to find anyone in the forward line that that can play string games together and. He Sam Powell Pepper's the best twenty-two player. What would you need him to average for the rest of the year to justify uh, s- selecting him? Because he is traded in by a few teams this week. Uh, you'd probably want him to, to average ninety plus for the rest of the year. But it's probably also worth noting that his last two games would have pushed his average up pretty dramatically. And is there any value in choosing him over like a Robbie Gray, 424K, break even a 31? Same thing, last two games, he's gone 104 and 118. I don't know what the correlation is between, I mean, I guess the last two games they've taken Collingwood and Fremantle. Maybe that's the correlation, but are either of these guys worth considering? I think the opponents are a better correlation than their form, to be completely honest. Um, I wouldn't pick either of them. I think that's fair enough, but there is one... Beautiful man on your lips, on everyone's lips. He's the talk of the town. Trent McKenzie has only played two games for the year so far in the absence of uh, Tom Cleary, but we've got the Cannon, Trent McKenzie, the cannon. 388K, averaging 96.5. Like I said, only played two games, but a 90 and 103. Well, he's doing exactly what he was doing in the sandful. He's getting a shitload of kicks, minimizing handballs, 17 kicks, no handballs, loves a mark, had 10 marks, doesn't mind taking a kick in. Look, I obviously, I love the cannon, unashamedly love, love, love the cannon. I can't tell anyone out there that that's a good idea. There's better defenders that are cheap, right? (laughs) Not that cheap. I mean, the only other name that we failed to mention when we were talking about GWS was Nick Haynes, who is... We did. He cost about $2. Who is 304K, but he's only had two scores, 85 or more for the year. And people will be tempted by him. Yeah, I'd I'd rather I'd rather Trent McKenzie, who's not even a guaranteed best 22 player than Nick Haynes, to be honest. I think I'd have to agree with that, to be honest. That's all right. Well, we should talk about the rookies because we've, we've mentioned Ned Reeves previously. Trent Bianco, defense, defender mid, $123,900. Break even is negative 84. He's produced uh, a scores of 75 on the weekend and 83 on debut. He's got to be a, a, almost a must trade in despite the fact that he misses round 14. He's projected to go up 71K this week. Yeah, I think he's probably the standout um, rookie option, but then you've also got Callum Coleman-Jones in the forward line at 161K. Yep, and I, look, I, 
He scored a 112 and an 86 in two games. His, his break-even is now negative 102 if he scores 86, which he's projected to, which he, he, he could do against West Coast. They're very injury-riddled at the moment. He's projected to go up 82K. I, look, I, I know this is crazy because he kicked four goals and two goals in his two games. Still not sold on him as a prospect, but who am I to disagree with his, with his scores? Um, I don't think long term it's a great move, but at this point, how can I how can I sit here and tell people not to trade him in? I'm gonna I'm gonna make a big call here, Leg. Yeah, he wouldn't be the worst rookie to have left on your field in the forward line if you had to keep him. You don't mind him as a emergency F six R two option because I guess that's the that's another added benefit. He's a ruck forward option player, so. There is some benefits to having him there. I do prefer Ned Reeves if I had to choose between the two at $123,900. Break even of negative 98, averaging 86. Coming off the bye, should play for the Hawks. They're probably the big three blokes that we're looking to trade in. And, And there's no issues with trading in any of them. They've shown us what they can do, even if I don't trust Coleman Jones. They've shown us what they can do. And you're talking about players who have the buy this week that you'd bring in just purely because they're playing next week. The one player that I can think of that isn't that whose price isn't completely out of this world is Tom Liberatore. Liber, Liber, Liber. Not even close to being in my notes, Demo. Tell me a little bit about him. So he can have up and down games, obviously tagged by Melbourne the week before. Tried to be tagged by Fremantle on the weekend, but then seven of their players went down in three seconds and things had to change. Um, but he's got a good ceiling. He's got a decent floor, averaging a hundred and uh, hundred and good God, where is it? One hundred and one point seven. 108.3 over the last three and 109.4 over the last five. So he's putting up scores. He's another guy in this price range, this mid 500 K price range. And I mean, my brain tells me if I can afford that, why wouldn't I go a 600 K player? Or if I'm not, if I'm considering him, um, but I'm not considering a 600 K player, why wouldn't I just go for an Uber cheap? But I'm also in a much uh, different position to a lot of players. And with Andy McGrath going down, that also opens the door for someone like Kyle Langford. Yes, like that one a lot. Like that one a lot. I uh, really like Kyle Langford. Um, spending a lot of time in the guts, can impact up forward, loves to kick goals against the Blues, uh, who they don't play again this year. Hmm, disappointing for you, Essendon. Um, but yes, another very enticing pick. Would I pick these these guys this week? I don't mind these guys, Damo. We've got four trades this week. If I have enough to field a team in round 13, and I think bringing one of these guys in to finish my team and maximize my opportunity to field 18 in round 14, I don't think it's a bad idea. I just want to find and meet the people who are fine this week and don't need to plan ahead. Because I need to plan ahead, Damo. I need to plan ahead as well, but I think I said at the top of the podcast, I'm happy to just close my eyes and let round 14 happen as well. Yeah, I think I'm just going to have to do that. I think I'm just going to have to do that. Well, Damo, we've taken a look at a lot of players. We've had some emotional moments and we've learned to become better friends. It's been a pleasure having you join me on the podcast. I, I appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Always a pleasure, Lek. And Damo, of course, where can we find you and where can we get questions in for your amazing mailbag podcast, which you do with Clarkie? Who's uh, who's joining you this week? I've got Patch joining us this week. Oh, I'll be sure to submit some questions then. Um, there is a tweet on the Jock Reynolds Twitter that you can put questions in. Uh, you can follow me at Damo SC. Uh, and yeah, get questions in. We record on Wednesday night, so you got to get it in before then. But uh, ask any question you like. Demo, always a pleasure. I love you. I wish our football clubs were better at football. And I'm glad to be back, baby. You can follow me on Twitter, at Lakedog. (sighs) 
I, I, I want to see how much you keep of that. 